Hello and welcome to The Big Picture and the in-depth version where uh, I take a topic, it might be an actor or a movie or a series of films, and we look a little bit deeper below the surface. So in this debut show, we're talking about the actor Dennis Hopper and his films. So what do we know about Dennis Hopper? Well, he was born Dennis Lee Hopper on May the 17th, 1936 in Dodge City, Kansas in America and sadly died on May 29th in 2010, age 74. From what I can gather, um, um, he was very interested in acting even as a kid and eventually attended the world famous actor studio um, and that led on to his first role in television in 1954 which then led on to a very small role in the James Dean classic Giant in 1956. And from then on he went on and had a fantastic career, a very successful career in television for 10 years um, which also allowed him to star in films, uh, Cool Hand Luke, I think, and Hang on High, which was, you know, two huge films at the time. Uh, and what also, what's perhaps not known about Hopper is that he also had a parallel career um, of being a photographer and developed that all the way through his, his career as an actor and became very acclaimed uh, as a photographer. So let's talk about the movies because that's the bit I'm interested in. So what was his first appearance on film? Well, it was widely reported for many years and it became, became a bit of a myth that he was actually... Uh, had a very small role in the film Johnny Guitar, made in 1954, or released in 1954, I should say. Um, but Hopper himself widely uh, dismissed that and said, I wasn't even in Hollywood when it was being made. So the actual first time he was on uh, Celluloid was in the James Dean film Rebel Without a Cause, which was released in 1955, and Giant, the film that was uh, released posthumously after Dean's death in 1956. Now, Hopper has gone on record many times to say how much he admired um, James Dean um, and what a massive blow it was when he died. So let's talk about James Dean uh, a little bit, because I think every every artist has a kind of, you know, a foundation, um, uh, you know, sort of inspiration. And I think it's pretty obvious that from uh, Danny Hopper's point of view, James Dean was that inspiration. Um, like I said, he's talked about how much he admired him and inspired him all the way through his career. And when James Dean passed away um, in that car accident in 1955, um, it affected Dennis Hopper enormously. Uh, and... I think, you know, it, it, in many, many ways, it sort of formed him as a character. I mean, certainly there's, there's anecdotes about them, him working with various film directors. A famous one was that uh, uh, I think in 1955, he was working on a movie shortly after Dean had, had, had the accident um, with uh, veteran film director Henry Hathaway. I think the film was called From Hell to Texas. And um, Dennis Hopper forced uh, Hathaway to shoot 80 takes of um, one particular scene until he eventually acquiesced, acquiesced rather, <laughs> to Hathaway's direction. Uh, mainly out of, out of, I think, sort of, you know, sorrow and, and you know, and all that sort of thing. Um, but it, it, it cemented his kind of bad boy image and this kind of this idea that um, he was a difficult guy to work with. And in fact, actually, Henry Hathaway said after the film was released that um, he was reported to have said to Dennis Hopper, your career is over in Hollywood. But of course, there's so much more to Dennis Hopper than just being a jobbing actor. He was a fine film director, and that's what I'm kind of interested in. I think he was a superb director, visionary, in fact, you know, um, very brave. Um, that's what a great artist is, I think, really. just a very brave person willing to take some risks. Um, and I think, you know, the, the movie that I, he's most associated with in many, many ways was writing, or co-writing, certainly, and directing Easy Rider in 1969. Um, he co-wrote that with uh, Terry Southern and uh, Peter Fonda. Now, the making of Easy Rider is the stuff of legends. They had a budget of $360,000 to $400,000 or thereabouts. And also Peter Fonda uh, said that he was putting down his credit card every day to the crew for travel, for hotels, for everything else that they may or may not have needed on top of that budget because they had so little to play with. Um, and also Laszlo Kovacs, I read in a recent interview, said that the, um, the budget went up by a million dollars after they made the film, just licensing the music. So it was clearly very difficult to make. Now, why is that? Well, I think because Hollywood at the time was still holding on to the reins of the old system and uh, having a young whippersnapper like, you know, Peter Fonda um, Terry and, and Terry Southern and Dennis Hopper, obviously, those three working uh, working together to try and create what ended up being a counterculture classic was probably, um, you know, completely against the grain of Hollywood at the time. 
But of course, the film was a runaway success and um, ushered in really a whole new wave of filmmaking through the 1970s, that wonderful period where filmmakers like William Friedkin, um, for instance, and, uh, and uh, actors like Jack Nicholson, who also had a small part in Easy Rider, you know, um, you know, defined themselves through that through that decade. Um, but it was also hugely critically uh, well received. Um, you know, through 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 their peers, you know the uh, the Cannes Film Festival. It won the best first work, and it was nominated for an Oscar that year uh, for the best um, screenplay. But um, it has to be said that it's a it's a defining moment in filmmaking, um, and also from a financial point of view, an enormous success. From a budget of, like I say, nearly say four hundred thousand dollars, it grows sixty million dollars. So what was the impact of the movie? Well, I'm going to read you uh, a couple of quotes from some journalists at the time. First one is Anne Hornaday, who wrote, with its portrait of counterculture heroes raising their middle fingers to the uptight middle class hypocrisies, Easy Rider became a cinematic symbol of the 1960s, a celluloid anthem to freedom, macho bravado and anti-establishment rebellion. I couldn't put it better myself. Uh, and another film critic, Matthew Hay, wrote, um, no other persona uh, better signifies the lost idealism of the 1960s than that of Dennis Hopper. Well, Fantastic. Well, I mean, I think that's the result, isn't it, of change um, and the bravery of people like Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda to take, um, you know, take on that role of of pushing the boundaries, you know, um, seizing the, what we call the Z-geist, I guess, you know, capturing the Z-geist. And, um, and I think really great art is all about reporting what's happening in front of you and the changes that are coming. And some people are brave enough to do it and some people aren't. They certainly were. Now, for me, as a, as a kid, uh, 12, 13 years old, I remember seeing Easy Rider for the very first time on British television very late night um, and being absolutely mesmerised by the, I think, the atmosphere in it more than anything else. And the kind of those those characters, you know, um, the, the, the enormity of it. And it was just when I was getting into rock. And so the whole idea of bikes and, um, you know, the music on the film, which was wonderfully put together, uh, really... I think captured me, you know. Um, and there's the one particular scene I remember more than anything else is the scene at the very end where they're being pursued by the guys in the in the truck, and the, the there's the shot where the guy shoots the bike from under Dennis Hoppy. I mean, you don't see him actually die, but you see the bike fly through the air, and it. I met, that's the image I have in my head. It felt like a bit like a sort of dinosaur or something, you know, crashing to the ground and all the rest of it. Had an enormous impact. And of course the music, um, like I say, Born To Be Wild being one of those songs that um, just about summed up everything, you know, at the time. And for me, you know, um, certainly because of the music that I was really starting to love and get into. And it was in fact the first song I performed live ever. Um, with my first band, Zeus, at a little place called Muston Lodge near Scarborough. OK, so what happened after the success of Easy Rider for Dennis Hopper? Well, it immediately made him a superstar. Uh, and Peter Fonda, they became the kind of core celebs of the time. You know, they were, and also the enfant terribles, you know, they were the people that had shown the new way to the, to the movie industry. So Hollywood reacted uh, in, in typical fashion by embracing them. And essentially, especially for Dennis Hopper, giving him complete and utter carte blanche to do what he wanted. Now, what was the result of that? Well, he started making a movie called The Last Movie, which was eventually released in 1971. Um, but again, another infamous tale of huge, uh, you know, excess and um, a huge amount of film, film use, you know, millions of feet of film was shot, you know, endless re-edits and all the rest of it. And it was a total critical and commercial total flop. After that disaster, he went back into acting, I think really just to rebuild his reputation and probably to make some money. But he started getting typecast as these sort of mentally challenged sort of psychos or outsiders, you know. And he starred in a few films. Um, there was a film called Mad Dog Morgan in 1976 and one called The American Friend in 1977 that very much were that kind of role. And it wasn't until Apocalypse Now, which was released in 1979, that he... I think really started to be noticed again and as, as, as a fantastic actor and of course that role as the photo uh, journalist who was one of Colonel Kurtz's kind of like acolytes if you like um, was a real standout role for that film and the film went on, to, went on to gross I think 100 million dollars from a 30 million dollar budget uh, so it was a huge success and brought him right back into uh, the limelight. 
So from that point on, his film career took a real upward turn. Um, and his, his third directional work was a movie called Out of the Blue, which was released in 1980. And that was met with fantastic critical acclaim, especially at the Cannes Film Festival, which is where he kind of started with Easy Rider. So I think that gave him the confidence you know, to kind of get back on the horse properly. Uh, and he started to get some fantastic roles. It was in Rumblefish in 1983 and the Osterman Weekend in also in 1983. But I think his work um, really started to take on an entirely different form um, and he was you know started to become this really acclaimed actor around about the 1986 period mid mid 80s um, specifically in two films Blue Velvet and Hoosiers. So we must talk about Blue Velvet, what a film, and directed by the wonderful David Lynch. Um, and at the time, David Lynch was looking for something really personal to make after the absolute disaster that was June that he made in 1984. Uh, I think because the, David Lynch's original movie, the first film he made, A Razor Head, was such an unusual, surrealistic um, movie that captured the imagination of of the art film world um, and just kind of gave him this reputation of a, an experimental filmmaker. He was looking to get back into that, but clearly he wanted to do something a bit more commercial. So he made um, Blue Velvet. Now, it's a film of extraordinary images. Um, it is largely regarded as kind of neo-noir, mystery thriller, psychological horror. There's lots of different descriptions of it. Um, but it's got an incredible cast. It's got um, uh, Cal McLaughlin uh, in it and uh, Isabella Rossellini, Dennis Hopper, of course, Laura Dern. Um, and it's named after, obviously after the song, the 1951 song of the same of the same title. It is about a student returning home who finds a severed ear in a garden <laughs> uh, and then gets embroiled in this kind of conspiracy, crazy sort of world of sort of conspiracy conspiracy and criminal activity, drugs, etc. But also, it's largely the central heart of it is the relationship between him and Isabella Rossellini's character, who was this lounge singer who he saw sing Blue Velvet in the film. But this really is Dennis Hopper's movie. I don't think there's a better example of psycho portrayed in film anywhere before or since, in my opinion. Um, he really, really owns it, and you can tell it's a kind of... Um, is absolutely absorbed in the whole idea of being frank, you know, um, and that's a measure of a great actor. But I would also offer that maybe quite a lot of it is himself anyway, you know. Um, I especially love the scene where, uh, you know, Carl uh, McLaughlin's character of Jeffrey is hiding in the closet when Isabella Rossellini's character of Dorothy comes home and then Frank comes in and he's breathing through that mask, some odd gas, you know, um, and, you know, uttering sort of violent remarks to her whilst he's kind of abusing her and crying his eyes out. It is hard to watch, but uh, absolutely mesmerising. But for me, it's the bravery of all of these actors, how they commit to the idea, this very surreal, strange story. Um, Isabella Rossellini, I think, is a standout as well, next to Dennis Hopper. They are a fantastic double act in this in this movie, as is Cal McLaughlin. I love the scene, again, just another one just to point out, um, is when they get captured by Frank, Dorothy and, and Jeffrey, and are taken away in a car, and uh, Jeffrey punches Frank, uh, which then Frank drags him out of the car and then kisses him all over his face and covers him in red lipstick and then beats him nearly to a pulp. Um, it is, again, very hard to watch. Uh, and just an extraordinary performance. So if you don't know the film, I recommend you watch it. It's certainly one of his finest. At the same time, uh, Hopper was also uh, nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actor in the movie Hoosiers. So, you know, his career really was on the up. And that led on to him making his fourth movie as a director called Colours. Um, very controversial movie starring Sean Penn and Robert Duval as two cops uh, in South Central uh, Los Angeles, uh, all about the urban gang violence. Um, and I remember that film coming out in, I think it was 1988, and the sort of equal criticism and praise about the making of the film. I mean, it was beautifully shot by the wonderful Haskell Wexler um, and looked great and it had some great pace to it. But I think, you know, it hasn't really aged very well as a film. Um, you know, we're now we're not obviously now in a time where we're we're looking at these the problems of gang warfare in an entirely different way. But at the time, I think it, um, it depicted it uh, for the first time, if you like, in, in a very modern context. It was at this point in the 90s that um, I myself had a strange connection to Dennis Hopper. Um, essentially what happened was that Dennis Hopper chose uh, the song Young Gods by Little Angels to be in his movie 
uh, Midnight Heat, which wasn't a great film, I've got to say, uh, but it also starred Adam, Adam Ant uh, and um, kind of crashed, in, uh, you know, didn't do anything, but it's still a fantastic uh, thing to be involved with. And um, because he's one of my favourite actors, uh, I always thought that was very, very cool indeed. So I carried on making movies through the rest of the 90s, um, uh, including some fantastic performances in uh, films like Ed TV. Uh, he had a small role in Basquiat about the painter, and also um, he was in True Romance, of course. Uh, but he disappeared into television a little bit. He had a leading role in a TV series version of the film Crash, which only lasted one season. And he sort of drifted away. I think times were changing and um, he was obviously an older guy by this point. Um, and when he passed away in 2010, at the age of 74, um, he died of prostate cancer, sadly. Um, he, you know, his legacy was absolutely intact and assured, really. And he, he even released three movies posthumously. Um, one was called Alpha and Omega in 2010. Another one was called The Last Festival, uh, which is 2016. And a long delayed version of a movie called The Other Side of the Wind, which was released in 2018, which had been filmed in the early 1970s. So there we are. That's my celebration of Dennis Hopper. I'm a huge fan. Um, if you don't know many of his films, then um, you know, go seek them out. Um, he's made more than you than you can possibly imagine, and you'll know a lot of them. So thank you for watching this. Thanks for listening. Um, there'll be another episode of uh, um, the Big Picture, and uh, we'll go deep. Have a deep dive into something else at another stage. Thanks again. Cheers.